Okay, open your Bible to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 14. We've been here before, but let's expand from this point, starting with Genesis 14. And God said, Let there be lights, circle that word lights, in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, circle the word signs, and for seasons, circle the word seasons, and for days, and let them be for lights, circle the word lights there, in the firmament of the heaven to give light circle that to give light upon the earth and it was and it was so let's go back to verse 14 and God said let there be lights literally in the Hebrew a luminous body a luminary let there be a luminary or because he's talking about the expansion of the universe, let there be a luminous body or bodies in the firmament of the heaven. When you look up at night, here in Los Angeles, it's hard to look up at night and see and get to appreciate God's creation in the heavens because it's blocked out with the city lights. Those of you who live more in the country Probably get a good view of it. And God said, let there be the, a luminous body or bodies in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from night and let them be for signs. You circle that word signs. What it means is beacons, flags, markers. So these luminous bodies are there as beacons, flags, markers. In Hebrew, you can even use the word memorials. And for seasons, you see the word seasons, but it means an appointed time or, in a fix, or a fixed time. So these luminous bodies are there as a beacon, a mark, a sign, a flag, for appointed times or a fixed time. So in other words, instead of just looking pretty in the sky, twinkle, twinkle, little star, they're there for a better reason, a more important reason. They're there to allow us to know information at a fixed time when God said time makes it understandable get it folks these luminaries that god created are beacons signs markers flags memorials set in their places waiting for their appointed times remember that in tonight's message waited waiting there for an appointed time the fixed time that God has dedicated those stars to reveal their message. That's why I said before the program, I mean before the teaching tonight, man has no excuse. If you don't want to believe his word, now it's more of a lost message in today's world than it was two, three, four thousand years ago. They had a better understanding of astronomy. Not astrology, but astronomy. I have no use for astrology. That's why it's important to understand the zodiac, the constellations and the decons. Everything associated with it. Now that you have that foundation that there are luminous body or bodies that are there 
for a sign, a memorial, a beacon, waiting for their appointed time, their fixed time in the history of all things, set forth when God has a purpose is to reveal something and what it means. Some of you have written to me and said, I read, read the book that you sent out free, Gospel in the Stars, or whatever the book was called. I read The Witness of the Stars. I read all these books. But I don't get as many things of, as you have gotten because it wasn't available to be known at the time. I don't care what star book you have. Most of them were written decades, even as over a century ago. They're incomplete. Why? Because things are constantly happening in the heavens, in the expansion of the universe. Now, there's a foundational material there that can be used. Things that God has already revealed. But as we get closer to these last days, certain things still need to happen, and they are happening. That's why I said preachers and pastors need to get their head out of the sand and stop looking for how this world's going to make a better life for you and realize that we are at the second advent. Jesus is coming soon. The question is, is the church ready? Or do they got their head in the sand? How can I make the best life for me now? I can't wait and rush to the Christian bookstore to pick me up a copy. Are you ready? Or have you taken it for granted? Like I said, it's has nothing to do with salvation. There's nothing you can do to earn that. It has a gift given to you. But once you receive it, as I said so many times, you're not supposed to be a Christian couch potato sitting back and saying, okay, Lord, I'm here just waiting for you. He has a purpose. He wants you to be invo involved in the capacities he's called you to be involved in. Period. Now that we know that there's luminaries out there, luminous bodies that are beacons, memorial signs, markers, flags, waiting for their appointed time, if their appointed time has not yet come, and I could look at the zodiac, not the astrology nonsense, but an astronomical zodiac, and there are several different types, folks, and it's important you pick the right type, by the way, which I'll get to it in the future. Because that's even been butchered over the millenniums, especially the last few centuries. But once you understand the zodiac and these stars, these beacons, these created things that God created to give us information, basically, are there for our benefit at their appointed time. And like I said, most of it already has been, I believe, declared in the heavens for you to make your, for you, for your benefit, so you, in my opinion, as a Christian, because you're already believing and trusting God's word to be true, to show up God to a non-believing world. If you don't believe me, then how, so, how come there's such a big coincidence between the message in this book and what's been declared in the stars? So with that, with that foundation, that starting point, let's move forward. Let's go to the New Testament. Since we're talking about stars, and you... And you, have, and you have heard, excuse me, when I'm about ready to read to you some verses over and over and over again till you turn blue. 
Everybody has a similar interpretation. Once in a while, you get some whack jobs to come up with some silly interpretation, but pretty much it's the same interpretation for these verses. Go to Matthew chapter 24. Starting with verse 29. Now, we've covered Matthew chapter 24 before several different times. But I want to focus right now on chapter 24, verses 29 through 31 in Matthew. Immediately after the, after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. I'm not going to talk about those two situations tonight. That's still reserved for a future program. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars fall and the stars shall fall from heaven. Circle those words. Stars shall fall from heaven. And the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Stars shall fall from heaven. Sorry, these are not comets. These are not meteorites. But we sometimes call shooting stars, which are not stars at all. No. We're not going to be bombarded. I'm not saying we're never going to be bombarded by any of these other celestial bodies. But not, that's not what this scripture is saying. Because all these scriptures tie in when we get there to the book of Joel. In other locations also. And that's not what the... And once you see how it ties in, you're going to say, wow, that's a perspective that gives clarity, in my opinion. It doesn't develop mystery or confusion or the opportunity to develop some Christian science fiction doctrine. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. Circle the word fall. What does that word mean? Well, it has several different meanings. But write it down on your margin. To descend from a higher place. To descend from a higher place. Use the word, not always, means something else. But what's important here to give a first definition to this, descend from a higher place, now write the rest of it, to a lower location or place. Got that? To descend from a higher place to a lower place. Sometimes the, the word is used, and I don't think it's by coincidence, and you'll see towards the end of this message why it's not by coincidence, that when this happens, sometimes something falls under judgment. Remember that. There's a lot of things you've got to remember throughout this message tonight. Maybe you need to listen to it more than once when it comes available in the website. So you're descending from a higher place to a lower place. And the words also that are used here carry an additional definition that judgment might come with it. Judgment might come with it. What could that mean? And the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sun, I mean, excuse me, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. I'll have more to say about that clouds later. Of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Which trumpet? And they shall gather together. Circle those three words. Shall gather together. So what I want you to remember 
about these luminous bodies that are descending from a higher to a lower place, possibly, we'll see if it does or not, carrying judgment with it, but also they're gathering. Gathering what? In this case, they shall gather together his elect in the four winds. Well, how is that going to be any, to do anything with judgment? Stay with me, folks. In this case, it doesn't. But it will for something else. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four of the winds. Shall gather together. Almost like a harvesting, isn't it? Stay with me. Now go to Mark. Chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. We'll start with verse 24. Mark 13, 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars of heaven shall fall. Circle that word for fall. A different word here is used for fall than in Matthew. And the stars of heaven shall fall. And the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. What does that word fall mean? Here, falling from a set position. I want you to write these things down because I'm going to tie this all together in about 45 minutes or so. And the stars of heaven shall fall, fall from a position or a set position, but some kind of position out in the luminous expansion of heavens we call the universe. Fall from a position, and then shall they see the Son of Man come in the clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels, and shall gather together his elect from the four winds. Through those words, shall gather together. Got it? Let's go to the Gospel of Luke and see what he has to say about it. Go to chapter 21. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verse 25. Verse 25 reads, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon, and I'll circle those words, and in the stars. There shall be signs. What kind of signs? And how does this tie in with the other verses? And upon the earth the stress of nations. We already have that. We're, we're with perplexity. We sure definitely have that. The sea and the waves roaring. Just look at the present tsunami and all the damage and destruction and death that it created. Certainly got that. And possibly more on its way. Men's heart failing them for fear. You know what them for fear means in the Greek? Or how it translates? That which strikes terror. That which strikes terror. Men's heart failing because they've been stricken with terror. Terror of what? You think because the signs in the heavens? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. But this is assumed that if the sun is darkened and the moon is darkened, 
And say we could explain that away. I'm not saying it is or isn't at this point. We could explain that away with just eclipses, like full eclipses. That's not going to bring terror, worldwide terror. But definitely, the distress of the nations with perplexity sure would bring terror, would strike terror. The seas and the waves roaring. Don't tell me that wouldn't strike some terror. Just look at this world. It's turning itself upside down for the wrong reasons. Nation against nation. The beast is establishing itself at a rapid pace. The eighth beast, as I've been preaching in this series. Striking their own type of terror. Men's heart failing them for, for that which strikes terror and looking after looking after with the meaning behind it of expecting something else, those things which are coming on the earth, which are happening on this planet. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And I've preached this before. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. The price that Christ paid for you, you as a chosen elect individual. Guess what? Jesus is coming soon. He is drawing nigh. The question is, has he sent a message in the stars? Now listen closely. Has he sent a message in the stars that he is on his way? I repeat. Has he already sent a message in the stars that he is on his way? We need to have the upward look. We need to lift up our heads and we need to see him coming. And can we? Yes, we can. Well, you're sounding too super spiritual for me now. Not if you can read what the luminaries have declared. What the stars have been telling us. And what they've been saying lately. I'm just giving you a synopsis of what's happened in the last 12 years. From the astronomical world of scientific information that's out there, it's not popular. You're not going to pick the, up the Time magazine or your local newspaper and read about it. Not many are tying all this together. But it's happening. Is Jesus Christ on his way? Is the message that he's already declared in the stars has given us the information to let us know. 
he is on his way. I'm sure I, I should just dangle you right there. I'm sure I got a lot of you scratching your heads. Say, what in the heck is he talking about? What is he getting into now? Which every pastor and preacher around this world should be getting into. I'll read you a message that came in just before I started teaching. And I will make a point how important you have become in a sense to be a luminary, the light of this world that will get this message to the hands. And I have literally probably over a hundred pastors and preachers now that are tuned in and glued to see where this series goes. And they already start teaching to their congregations, no matter small or large, what to expect in these last days. So what's happened recently? Back in 1999, something happened. And I'm just going to give you a very general synopsis because I don't have time to go into this much scientific material written by astronomers and physics. And physics, I mean, uh, um, not physics, um, physicists. I don't have the time. And I'm sure I put most of you asleep. Because the way they write it and pass on the information, it's definitely a sleeping pill. But I don't know if any of you have ever heard of gamma ray bursts. And what's been happening? Now, there's gamma ray bursts. Nothing unusual about that. But in the last little over a decade, there's been two unusual ones. And what makes them unusual is where they're coming from. Where they're coming from. What do you mean? Now this is, I'll just read you. I've just highlighted, because I'm not going to read it. I just brought you a few pages. It's this thick. Of what happened back in 1989. This is straight out of Pasadena. I'm a stone throw away from Caltech. An extraordinary, I'll just read it to you. Extraordinary bright cosmic gamma ray flash turns out to be the most energetic one measured so far. That was back in 1999. Well, I guess what? Since 1999, something else has happened. The most energetic one measured so far, according to the team of astronomers from the California Institute of Technology, like I said, a stone throw away from where I'm at, where I'm located. The, the burst appeared to me more luminous than the whole rest of the universe. And that would, be the ver that would be very hard to explain by most current theories, said one of the Caltech professors. One of the principal investigators on the team said it's remarkable. It was 10 times more luminous than the brightest burst seen so far. And that was quite un unexpected. If the gamma rays were emitted, in all directions, their energy would correspond to 10,000 times the energy emitted by our sun over its entire 
lifetime so far. I don't even think we can imagine that. We could read it, but can you really imagine that? I'll read it to you again. The gamma rays that were emitted from this, the energy of it would correspond to 10,000 times the energy emitted by our sun over its entire lifetime so far, which is about, according to their calculations, 5 billion years. Yet the burst lasted only a few tens of seconds. This burst, called GRB 990123, was discovered by the PEPOSAC satellite in January 1999. It was the brightest burst seen so far by this satellite. And one of the brightest ever seen by NASA's Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. And I'm not going to give you all the rest of the details. I think you got the picture how remarkable this was. Now, I'm going to skip a lot of information because I'm going to run out of time. This happened in 1999. And guess where it came from? What constellation? Virgo. And I'll have to say, I have more to say about Virgo and the decans in Virgo, the three different decans in Virgo, in about a half hour. But it came from the constellation in the zodiac structure of Virgo, in the decan of the Otis. the way the Greeks would pronounce it, B-O-O-T-E-S, which in Greek mythology but not just Greek mythology because they had to get it from somewhere before they ever got their hands on it and it was not based on mythology. Now these astronomers don't know how to explain it so they put it in the category of mythology. And of course, Boetus has a spear in the right hand. Now some, there's two different ways to interpret this constellation, Decon, of Boetus in Virgo. Some has a spear on his right hand and a sickle on his left. Some has a shepherd rod. Rod, R-O-D, and a sickle. Either one works. Because as you'll see, he comes as a shepherd, all right. He comes with judgment. And he comes with, as a shepherd with the rod in his hand to issue out punishment and judgment. That's what that dead con means. And he also comes with a sickle on his left to reap a harvest. Remember I told you he shall gather? Or a gathering will take place? Well, a gathering can take place whether it's a gathering of the wicked or the gathering of the faithful. But I'll have more to say about that. So here is Boetus. Some just call it boots. With a spear in his right hand and a sickle in his left. Now, Boetus comes from the Hebrew root Bo, B-O. And what does that mean? It means the coming. Or the coming one. Who? Now, where this gamma ray burst took place, something that even shocked the ast astronomical world because what it produced, literally it produced 10,000 10, times more energy than the sun could emit over a 
five billion year period. Can you even imagine that kind of energy? What is that, 10th to the 47th power of something or other? It's unthinkable. A million, billion, billion, billion times the energy that was released from the bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima. Did you get that? A million, billion, billion, billion times. That's a lot of energy, folks. And this energy burst took place at the tip of the spear or the rod in the hand of Boötis. Which also means not just the coming, the coming one, but also the coming judge. In that frame of me a reference, how it deals with the wicked, the ones that rejected Jesus Christ, it declares a coming judgment day. A coming judgment day. You get it, folks? Now, that happened back in 1999, and I don't want to dwell on that one because I want to talk more about the next one. Now, that was the most amazing thing anybody's ever seen up to this point, back in 1989. But what happened in 2008, in March? Another GRB, this one happens to be 080319B. According to their classification, and back in March 2008, not that long ago, something else remarkable happened. Now, I'll tie this all in together, folks. Just bear with me through this scientific stuff. NASA Swift, Swift satellites detected an explosion. Remember I told you that, and I showed you that picture just before we went into the teaching session? That's an artist's rendi rendition of the explosion. Now you know what you were seeing. NASA Swift satellite detected an explosion from the constellation Boötis. Another one in this same general area. And sent an alert to ground-based telescopes. At the same moment, the Russians, the CONUS instrument on NASA's wind satellite and robotic wheeled Wide field optical camera called Pie of the Sky in Chile captured the first visible light from this incredible, bright, and powerful gamma ray burst. Within the next 15 seconds, the burst brightened enough to the visible to be visible in a dark sky to human eyes. And that is important to remember. Remember how I started? Man has no excuse. You did not need even need a, a small little minor telescope. Forget the Hubble in the, in, the, in, the, in space. You could see what happened to this particular star with the human eye. And when you find out how far away it was, and when it happened, it's remarkable, folks. Is it by chance? Is it by coincidence? For it to be happening now, in 2008, and does it carry a meaning behind it? And no one's without excuse. It could be seen by anyone on this planet without any instrumentation. Within the next 15 seconds, the burst bright enough to be visible in the dark sky to human eyes for a few moments. The GRB had a million times, a million times, wrap, yourself, wrap your mind around these figures, had a million times the luminosity of the entire Milky Way galaxy. 
Can you even imagine that? The GRB had a million times the luminosity of the entire Milky Way galaxy. It briefly crested at a magnitude of 5.3 on the astronomical brightness scale. Incredibly, the dying star was 7.5 billion light years away. Astronomers say the reason this gamma ray burst was so bright was that it was aimed directly at Earth. Some say it was almost directly, and some have claimed since this studies come out, because they keep on studying this because it's so remarkable, it was deranged directly at Earth. Now, what's the coincidence of that? In the Buddhist, Buddhist, in the Bo 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 Otist, excuse me, not Buddhist, Deccan in the constellation of Virgo, a part of the zodiac structure in the sky. What's the coincidence directly pointing at Earth? And does it have a reason why it's pointed at Earth? Observations of the event of the GRB are giving astronomers the most detailed pro portrait of the GRB ever recorded. You have to have the satellites in orbit and the rapid response telescopes, telescopes on Earth in order to take complete advantage of this rare kind of event. Judith Rakusin of Penn State University and a team of 92 co-authors report on observations across the spectrum that began 30 minutes before the explosion and followed its afterglow for months. The team concluded the burst ex extra extraordinary brightness arose from an unusual two-component, now this you've got to wrap your mind around, you have to listen closely, from an unusual two-component jet that shot material directly toward Earth at 99.99995% the speed of light. In other words, something is coming out of this star as a projectile shooting out and away from the star directly pointed and coming and thrusting down to Earth. They call it a two-component jet. Now, a head-on burst directed towards Earth only occurs by chance only about once a decade. So a GRB is a rare catch. Gamma ray bursts are the universe's most luminous explosions. Most occur when massive stars run out of a nuclear fuel. As a star's core collapses, it creates a black hole. You can start putting the pictures up, and I'll, I'll tell you when to change it. It, create a, it creates a black hole. You might need to put your nose at the screen because these pictures are not that great, but it's the best I could find. It creates a black hole or neutron. That's the star that I'm talking about now. You see there a close-up version on the left side of the screen and the right side of the screen you see it from a distance. As a star core, most occur with massive stars run out of nuclear fuel. As a star core collapses, it creates a black hole or neutron star that through processes not fully understood drive powerful gas jets outward. These jets punch through the collapsing star as the jets shoot into space. They strike gas previously shed by the star and heat it. That generates bright afterglows. The team believes the jet directed from this particular star towards Earth contained an ultra-fast component just 0 0.4 of a degree across. This core resided within a slightly less energetic jet about 20 times wider. 
A normal signature is different from what we saw in this burst. In this object, we see two signatures of jet with two different properties. Perhaps every gamma ray burst has a narrow jet, but astronomers missed it most of the time, but they sure caught this one. We happen to view this monster, I don't really consider it a monster, but this monster down the barrel of a very narrow and energetic jet. This is what they caught. And of course, I go to other studies and other material written about this guitar is once in a lifetime. Once in, I think, the Earth lifetime experience. It's never happened before like this, folks. And it will never happen again just like this. This unique beacons of light were observed in only eight minutes after the trigger and are the brightest burst ever detected. Go to the next picture. I'll take a drink of water while they're going to the next picture. Looks like the video stuck. No, that's an artist's rendi rendition of the star just before the burst. Now go to the next picture. Ah, it's too bad it's not lined up correctly. But just on the left-hand side off the screen is where the star originates from. And what they're talking about with this ultra-fast jet-like component you see that cone you see the wider version of the cone that's the two component type of jet they're speaking of but inside that wider cone there's a more narrow and energetic jet or or cone you see that right in the middle now what they're saying not so much what I've read here to you before, but to give you a synopsis of all the studies, that narrow energetic jet you see there in the center, a cone within a cone, shooting from the gamma burst that was created by that star, let's just call it falling from heaven or removing its position to another position from a higher location now to a lower location. Get it, folks? For a purpose, by the way. And it's directly pointed to where? Remember, the universe is vast. It's unthinkable how large this universe is. From where this star is located, Earth, I can't even say it's the, it's, it's the top of a pin head. If you're looking from the star towards Earth, you probably couldn't even see it. But Earth, in the vast expanse of the universe, is nothing. Is nothing. It's a piece of rock, a very tiny even the most powerful microscope, if you could look at it that way to give you an analogy, couldn't even see it. But this gamma ray burst with an energetic jet, I believe, a stream of information to let us know, coming from the Buotis, Deccan, and the constellation of Virgil, happened at this time for a purpose. So to give you an idea what these scientists are trying to explain, this is a picture you can take a look at and show you. And it doesn't happen like this all the time, folks. Usually you don't have a two energetic jet flow or stream flowing from a star that no longer exists. Period. Now, if this was going to happen in our own galaxy, we would be considered 
doomed, definitely in trouble. If this kind of gamma ray burst even happened in our own galaxy, our atmosphere would be so changed that it would be like going through what they call a nuclear winter. Now, we are fortunate not to be living in a galaxy. Now, don't go to the other pictures yet. Come back to me. Let me read you a different point of view. March of 2008. This one says it was an exciting day for NASA. It was even more of an exciting day. Once you know what it symbolizes for every Christian walking this planet that are still alive today. It was an exciting day for NASA. Why? Because it was special. But we don't know why. Why? They, I, didn't make a, I didn't repeat myself by accident. That's how they wrote it. We don't know why. Why it was special. Well, I do. They finally try to explain it why away with, with the explanation I just gave you. A jet within a side of jet. It's so unique. It's never happened before. And that inner jet is directly pointed at Earth. There was something amazing about it. Something different about it than the other cosmic births. The NASA Swift satellite detected that day. Even by the standards of gamma ray bursts, this burst was a whopper. This is a scientist talking like this. It blows away every gamma ray burst we've ever seen so far. The optical afterglow was 2.5 million times more luminous than the most luminous supernova ever recorded, making it the most intrinsical bright object ever observed by humans in the universe. It was so bright that immediately after the blast, Swift ultraviolet and optical telescope and X-ray telescopes indicated that they were effectively blinded. Even the instrumentations went to black. They couldn't handle the overload. Are you getting it, folks? How unique this was? And because even the instruments were affected by it, they were overloaded, they were blinded, they went black. This led the scientists and the researchers to think that something had gone wrong with the instruments. No. For a few precious seconds, the luminosity was a million times that of the whole galaxy. And on top of that, the burst shattered the record of the farthest object. The farthest object that's ever been visible to the naked eye. The previous record was a spiral galaxy called M33, which is thousands of times closer than the March explosion. If you're having trouble grasping the magnitude of such an occurrence, and I'm sure we are, don't feel bad. Don't feel bad that you can't. Because they're having a hard time coming with an analogy to put um, the amount of type of energy that was released. Where, where they like to say, normal people can't understand. They say the numbers are staggering. Well, you're overselling it. No, I'm not. If anything, I'm underselling because I don't have the time to spend on it. Even astrophysicists are blown away. I just love it when things happen in these constellations that blow away the scientists. A certain astrophysic group head at the Special Astrophysical Observatory said, this is, this is a quote, this is a true miracle to see such, such an optical flare. Only if they knew how much of a miracle it was. 
Astronomers began their scientific analysis beginning 30 minutes before the explosion after following it afterglow for months. They start talking. Until recently, they didn't know why the why. Why it was so powerful? What made this different? And why the afterglow was so much bigger than any other after, afterglows observed up to this point. Remember, it was not that long before 2008. Back in 1999, they experienced something like that. But that was nothing. That was just getting our attention. Now, here comes the final message. Of course, they went on to explain why the afterglow, why the why. It turns out the jet of the material shot out from this dying supernova star almost directly toward the Earth at 99.9999% the speed of light. I already told you that. That's their explanation of it. What's interesting about this burst is that both the optical afterglow and the X-ray afterglow are inconsistent with other current theoretical understanding of how these objects work. This was different. This was unique. This is unexplainable. And you won't be able to explain it unless you attach something to it. God's word and the understanding of what the zodiac means. Not the butchered, wicked versions of what the zodiac has become, but what God's word says and what God declared in the zodiac as a true message. It forced us to really test our understanding of these objects. And as a result, we have come up with an alternative explanation. So NASA science has come up with a two-component jet mo mo model, which I already showed you, in which there is both a wider outer jet, the outer cone that I showed you, which is the characteristic, characteristic, characteristic of the, what we usually see within these objects. That outer cone, can you put it up real quick? Or you're already moving on to the other picture. If you haven't, put it up. That outer cone you see there, that's the normal outburst. What made this unique is that inner jet, that one that comes directly at Earth, pointed at Earth. That narrow inner jet. The outer cone is the norm. The unique inner cone, the outburst, the flowing information directly designed to reach Earth. Nowhere else, by the way, is what makes it unique. Why? Why? The now jet just happens to be pointed at Earth this time which makes us think that most of the time the narrow jet just isn't pointing directly at us if you compare it to other gamma bursts. This allows us to see objects in a new way. Yes, and not by accident. This particular star that sent forth this information. You get it, folks? Now, come back to me. This explosion took place about 7.5 billion years ago as we measured time. If how we measured time is accurate. And that's a big what if. But let's just take it as a fact for now. 7.5 billion years ago. This thing exploded. We got the information in 2008. Be why? Because it's so far. And even though it's traveling at speeds that are mind-blowing, it takes time when you're that far away to arrive at its de destinational point. In this case, directly to Earth. I believe by design, by the Creator. This explosion took place 7.5 billion years ago, a time when the universe was less than half its current age and yet to be formed, and Earth had yet to be formed.
This is more than halfway across the visible universe. No other known object or type of explosion could be seen by the naked eye at such an immense distance. If someone just happened to be looking at the right place at the right time, they saw the most distant object ever seen by human eyes without an optical aid. Without an optical aid. Now, I don't know what you have for the next picture. I don't remember now, but put it up. Now we're going to talk about the constellation of Virgo, but, mo uh, but I'm going to specifically talk about Bootis. Now, let me put my other glasses on so I can see the screen. Now this is kind of a dark picture, the way it's contrast on the screen, but this is the best I could find. This is Bootis in the constellation of Virgo. Bootis or Bootis means the coming one. The coming one. Who is the coming one? I will show you in scripture is Jesus Christ. But Otis, and keep it on the screen, is symbolized and its meaning in this particular decan in the constellation of Virgo is a hurried man with a spear in his right hand or rod and a sickle in his left, as you can see there on the screen. The Greeks called him Boötis, stemming from the word, as I already said, Bo, which means to come. The brightest star in his constellation, Arcturus, and the one of Leof, believes is the most beautiful one in the heavens. How ironic, isn't it? By the way, keep the picture on the screen. You see me enough. You don't need to look at me. You go to Job. You don't have to go there if you don't want, but write it down. Job chapter 9. As soon as I get there, I'll tell you exactly where in chapter 9. Verse 9. Well, verse 8. Which alone spread out the heavens and, the, and threaded upon the waves of the sea, which make Arcturus, Orion, or Orion, and Pleiades, and the chambers of the south. Now, I have a lot to say about Job in the future. Most people read Job and never catch what the message in the stars is declaring to the book of Job. But I'll come back to that in the future. But here it's mentioned in Job, chapter 9, verse 9. And Arcturus probably was the original name for this constellation, but that doesn't really matter at this point. It can be found by extending an imaginary arc from the end of the handle of the Big Dipper about 30 degrees, which you see there in the screen. Again, Arcturus means he, com he comes, or he is the coming one. The ancient Egyptians called Bootis Mach, or Math, which means one who rules or governs. The one that's coming that rules and governs. Which also carries the meaning the branch threading underfoot. The star just below his waist. I don't know if you can see it there in that picture. But the star below his waist is Marak or Mazar or Izar. Depending where you're at and how you pronounce it. Marak means the coming forth as an arrow. Where Izar means preserver or guarding. The star in his head is called Nakar, which means the pierced. And another Hebrew name is Merga. Merga, meaning who bruises. Thus, this constellation and all the associated ones speak of the personage of Christ. You don't have to be a rocket science folks to see the significance of these names in Boetis. It speaks of a coming one, he that cometh who judges by threading on their foot and bruises. Who, you can find that in Genesis 
Keep it on the pitcher still. I'll tell you when you get off the pitcher. Genesis 3.15. I believe it's 3.15. Yes. And I will put an enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. It speak of a cunning one who judges by the threading of their foot and bruises. He is identified. Who is that he? Jesus Christ. As a branch and as the one who comes quickly to rule. And if that is true, has he sent the message through what just happened, not just in 1989, but the final delivery directly pointed at earth, declaring as an appointed time, as I read early to you in verses in, the, in Scripture, the appointed time is set time when it starts a period of look up, lift up, your redemption draw it nigh. Remember, I said this was in the Virgo constellation. And in the Virgo constellation, you have three decons. What are those three decons? Come back to me now. Well, Coma, which is the desired son, that signifies the promise of the coming of a Messiah from a virgin. That's number one. Okay, number two is the centurist or the centaur. What is that? Without giving you all the explanation of what it means, just remember this for now. This particular decon signifies Christ as the sin and the atonement sacrifice. So you have him coming as the Messiah through his birth, through a, by his birth through a virgin. Why? For the purpose that will, which was, was promised as a sin offering, an atonement sacrifice for who? For our benefit. And the last of the three decons in that Bootis part of the constellation of Virgo is the Good Shepherd. Jesus Christ, the Yahshua, as some would proclaim. The Good Shepherd, the flock of the sheep, which is represented by the nearby Ursa Major, and also it represents the wrathful, 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 excuse me, judgment of the unfaithful flock, the goats, signified by and symbolized by Ursa Minor, which is another time, another place, another teaching. And I know I'm throwing a lot in, but I want you to get the general points of this. Everybody tries to mystify that teaches in eschatology Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, Joel, Genesis, Job. And they try to mystify. It's almost like it's going to be fireworks every night and day in the, in the heavens. If it was that easy and that obvious, we would have a world to be repenting. Because whatever preachers and witnesses of Christ that are left that serve Jesus Christ would make one heck of an impact, wouldn't they? Because they have verification for that. But it's not that easy and not that simple. You have to have eyes to see and ears to hear. So you have the Messiah by a virgin. You have the suffering Christ as a sin offering and an atonement for sacrifice, an atonement sacrifice, excuse me. And you have the good shepherd that deals with the flock of sheep that are faithful and the flock of sheep that are unfaithful. You get it, folks? Now, can we tie that in with scripture? Now, put it back on Buotis. Now, is that the last picture? I don't remember. If that's the last picture, don't go to any other picture. But if there's another picture after this, put it up. I might have you go back to this picture, but I don't know if this is, I think this is the last picture. And it's good because I'm running out of time anyway. Go to Joel, chapter 2. We've been there recently. But let's go there again. Joel, chapter 2.
Verse 10. The earth shall quake before them. The heaven shall tremble. Sounds like Matthew, Mark, and Luke, doesn't it? The sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. Remember, I told you this is a different explanation of something that's going to happen or already has happened or maybe both then verse 28 not verse 28 verse 30 where it says i will show wonders in the heavens and the earth blood and fire and pillars of smoke the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood that's a whole different scenario folks don't tie these two things these two events together because it's not well what is it well you have to keep on listening the earth shall quake, back to verse 10 in Joel chapter 2. The earth shall quake before them. The heaven shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw. So look at that word withdraw. They're shining. What does that word withdraw mean? Actually, it has two different meanings. And both apply. Why? Because Be Beotis has two meanings and what it symbolizes which has already sent its message directly to this earth to let us know that he is coming. A clock has started. Withdraw, they're shining. Write it down. Withdraw can mean the collect, I mean, not collect, remove, or the stars shall remove their shining. Well, that's actually what happened with that gamma ray burst. It no longer exists, and if calculations are right, it bursted 7.5 million years, a billion years ago for a direct appointed time by sending its message, its unique message, pointed directly to Earth to let us know something, to give us information, to make us understand what's about ready to happen. Remove, take away, that's one meaning, but the other meaning is also to gather and collect. How ironic, isn't it? Isn't that what Bootis means? Now the sickle there is for different reasons. The sickle could be far as destroying the wicked but also to gather the harvest. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. Now, I'm running out of time. They tell me I have about 15 minutes left, so I have to hurry up now. You go to Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3, starting with verse 11. Assemble yourselves and come, all you heathen, in other words, heathen, collect yourselves. Collect yourselves for what? For a certain appointed time. This is none other than Armageddon. When the heathen are gathered and come against the saints. And the Lord Jesus will deal with them. Assemble yourselves, come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither. Now stop there about. These are two different statements made in one verse. Let's read it again slowly so you don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. And assemble yourselves and come all ye heathen and gather yourselves together round about. So the heathen are gathering themselves round about somewhere, some location. I already told you it's Armageddon. Thither cause the mighty ones to come down, O Lord. What mighty ones? Are we talking about people here? We're obviously not talking about the heathen are supposed to gather themselves. They're definitely not from the Lord. Because literally this verse in the Hebrew says, the Lord shall bring down the mighty one. Bring down from where? What, who's the mighty one here? And who's coming? We know the heathen coming. Could there be something else that's coming? 
Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. That's what that sickle on the left, left hand there is symbolizing. Verse 13 makes it clear. Put ye in the sickle. Put ye in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down. For the press is full of the vats. Overflow, for their wickedness is great. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down. Who's this referring to? Who's coming? I already stated who that was. For the harvest is ripe. That message already has been declared in the star, in the heavens, and it's been here for the last little over three years that he is coming, and he has sickle in hand, folks. Multitudes of multitudes in the valley of decision for the day, or the threshing valley, literally. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining or remove or be taken away. You think that's just an ironic, poetic way of putting these verses together that the writer creatively imagined? I don't even think the writer even had an any knowledge of what he was writing about. He was being just directed by the Holy Spirit to put it down. So from 1989, at least 2008 for sure, we have the message of the day. The testament of the day. Of what is about to happen. Not just in the book of Joel. You go to the book of Revelation. Start with verse 14 in chapter 14. I will close with this tonight. I could go to the Psalms and other places to declare this message. Let's go to Revelation chapter 14. And I look and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud. Now this is not like a vapor cloud. There's different words for cloud or clouds in the Greek. This is not like a vapor cloud where rain gathered or water vapor gathers and rain falls from it. No, this is the same kind of word that was used in the Greek that you could identify within the Hebrew. Used of the cloud which led the Israelites into the wilderness. The same kind of word was in the Greek was adopted really from the Hebrew to give it a definition of what it was trying to mean and say here. He's coming on some kind of cloud, the cloud that went with the children of Israel in the wilderness back in the Old Testament. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having one of his... Uh, having on his head, excuse me, a golden crown in his hand, a sharp sickle. Boetus, the coming one, the coming Christ, which is on his way. The Son of Man, which is Jesus Christ, having on his head a golden crown in his hand, a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice in that sun the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle. When this happens, this means Christ has come. And now, judgment and punishment is soon to follow. Another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in the sickle and reap. For the time, literally the hour. What hour? we got to look into that, don't we? It's come for thee to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. Or literally dried. And he sat on the cloud. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in the sickle on the earth. And the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. 
another angel came out from the altar, which he had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had a sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in the sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle unto the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. This is not the saints that are being collected here, folks. This angel and his sickle is thrusting it forth to deliver the wrath of God. This is different. And the winepress was thrown without the city, and the blood came out of the winepress, even to the horse's bridle by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Now, I'm running out of time. The point that I wanted to make tonight, the picture you see on the screen there, something unique that no one's ever experienced before, and they didn't even, even though it's been recorded with instrumentation, they didn't even need something this so far out in space, any instrumentation to see it, because Christ... declared his message for all who have eyes to, he may eyes to see and definitely the fans see it, ears to hear because the information is out there now, folks. The scientific world has been talking about it for some time, for a few years now. You should see some of the explanations they're still trying to come up with to explain this away. Why it possibly is not unique, but they can't because it is unique. It's never happened before in recorded history. It's never happened this way. It never was that directly pointed any gamma ray burst towards the earth. I've told you, come back to me now, it was for a purpose. It was to send us a message. There are ones that are still living today. The message, back in Luke, chapter 21, And when these things begin, and it has begun, come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Your redemption draweth nigh. This decon in outer space, as we would call it, in the heavens, in the expansion of the universe, bursted so long ago to allow us to know in the time period that you're living today that he's on his way. He's on his way. That message was delivered a little over three years ago. How closer we are in 2011 for his arrival. Otis talks about a son born of a virgin, the Messiah, talks about the sin offering that he was and atonement for sacrifice, but it concludes with him coming as the good shepherd not only to gather the flock that are faithful, but to deal with the unfaithful, the wicked, his sickle, will do both. I don't want to be on the wrong end of it, though. I don't want to be on the Ursa minor end of it. I want to be on the Ursa major of it. And I'll have more to say about that in the future. These signs are not a mystery once it's declared. Stop listening to these, and I don't know how any other way to say it, to get the point across, stop listening to these bozos don't have a clue. And all they can do is fantasize and make up more Christian science fiction doctrine. God's word is not about confusion. It's about clarity. And he has his appointed times, as I pointed out in the previous verses, which we covered earlier, to send his message, to declare his message. The question 
tonight, as I raise the last program, are you ready? Are you preparing? Are you looking up, lifting up your heads? Because your redemption draweth nigh. Why? Because since 2008, he's on his way. And like I said a, a moment ago, if he's been on his way for a little more than three years, how sooner, I mean, how closer he is today in 2011? You could think this is all a coincidence. The stars say differently. And when you line up the stars with God's word, it all comes together. I'm a little bit aggravated tonight because I wanted to give you so much more. But I think I gave you enough. Enough to piece it together using God's word. And show you how the science world, once again, proves God's word, whether they realize it or not. And most of them didn't. Thank God for his faithfulness. I can't wait to his arrival. Are you ready? Are you trusting and faithing in him? Play the song. Let me know what you got of this teaching.